Phil will refer to Jonah 3 a little bit later in the message, but we always try to pick a, a chapter to read in correspondence with the theme of the message. Romans chapter 2, the major theme in Romans, of course, is justification before God, how a lost, unrighteous sinner can be justified before a righteous God. How in the world is that possible? Well, Romans explains that. And the Apostle Paul states up front that this justification is by faith. The theme of Romans is Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And, of course, it was to the Jew first during the transitional period in the book of Acts. But he goes on to say, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So he states up front that we are justified by faith alone, but before he explains how God justifies sinners by faith, he first proves that all are under sin and therefore cannot be justified by their own supposed righteousness because the Bible says in Romans 3 there is none righteous. No, not one. So the first main part of Romans, beginning in verse 18 and running all the way through chapter 3, verse 20, is condemnation on the whole world. Because as long as you think you have some righteousness, you'll not trust Christ for His righteousness. So before you get to the good news of justification by faith, you've got you to get the bad news that you're an unrighteous, condemned sinner. Now the latter part of the first chapter reveals God's condemnation of the whole Gentile world. That's in chapter 1, verse 18 to 32. And he shows the devolution of society, not the evolution, but the devolution, the downward spiral. When they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, and so on. And he lists all these awful things they were involved in. Now the natural response of self-righteous religious people to what Paul said in the latter part of chapter 1 is to pass judgment on those wicked sinners and proudly boast, I'm better than that. I'm not like that. So I'm, I'm good. I'm okay. I, I'm right with God because I'm not like the heathen are. And so Paul anticipates that very response as he begins in chapter 2. Notice in verse 1, Therefore thou art an inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. And he's going to go on to condemn the Jews, that they're not righteous. He talks about the Gentiles. He talks about the Jews. Here, this applies to any self-righteous religious person. There are people like that among the Gentiles and the Jews. He said, Whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. So if you can look at somebody and say, that's wrong, but then you do it too, then you're, you're also condemning yourself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. The old saying is, when you point a finger, remember you got three pointing right back at you. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. You know, there's a lot of unrighteous judgment going on among men. But God is a righteous judge. He always judges perfectly. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering? In other words, they think they're doing pretty good and, and they're right with God. But they don't understand God's just being long-suffering and forbearing with them and wanting to see them come to salvation. Whether it's an immoral pagan or a religious lost person, flesh is flesh. And there's none righteous. And the only way to be just before God is by the righteousness of Christ, uh, by the faith of Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all in Him. It's not in us. Whether it's, again, pagan flesh or religious flesh, it's still flesh. And the whole world is condemned in their flesh. That's what he's dealing with in the first main part of Romans. 
So he says, despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Saying God is being so good to you and his forbearance with you and his long suffering with you. And that's designed to bring you to what? Repentance. Is he talking about a lost man here? Yes. Does a lost man need to repent? Yes. Who said that? The Apostle Paul. Writing in Romans, the doctrinal book, the foundational doctrinal book for this age of grace, the doctrinal book about salvation. He said, verse 5, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart. Impenitent means not repenting. Not sorry. Not changing your mind about things. Now notice this. This is very important to understand. What's involved in repentance is the heart. Okay? He said you have an impenitent heart. That implies that the heart is involved in repentance. He said, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation, the righteous judgment of God. And there's much more I'd like to say, but it's not my point this morning to expound in the passage. I'm just using this as a starting point. Paul said that lost sinners need to repent. Repentance is mentioned over a hundred times in the Bible. Uh, 46 times in the Old Testament, 65 times in the New Testament. And we're not going to look at every reference, okay? So uh, we'll look at some, but we'll not look at them all. But we want to look at enough just to establish what it is. What is repentance? And then answer the question, I think we already have in what we just read, but the question is whether or not it's necessary for a sinner to repent to receive salvation in the age of grace. You know, this is the only passage actually in Paul's epistles in which he mentions the need for lost sinners to repent. This is the only passage in all of his epistles where he, he says this. But he says it. Okay? And he also mentioned it, and we'll look at it later, in that context of lost sinners needing to repent. He mentioned it several times in the book of Acts. Acts 17, verse... 30, Acts 20, verse 21, and Acts 26, verse 20. So, the point is, he didn't emphasize it. It wasn't the theme of his message. He didn't go forth constantly saying, repent, repent, right? He didn't emphasize it, but he did preach that it was necessary for sinners to repent. Now, there's so much confusion and controversy about this issue of repentance and it's because of all the various ways the religious world tries to define it. The Roman Catholics turn repentance into penance. There's a difference. But if you look at their Bible, so-called, the douay Rheims version, the Catholic Bible says penance 69 times. Guess how many times it's in the King James Bible? Not at all. But they put it in there 69 times. And in many places where it says repent in the King James, the Catholic Bible says do penance. Do penance. Works. Penance is afflicting yourself to earn forgiveness. Doing things to try to achieve acceptance with God. Now, the Protestants are not quite as bad, but yet they also make it something else. It's not repentance with the Protestants. Usually it's penitence. And that is sorrow for sin. Now, I think that's involved, but that's not repentance. Sorrow for sin is involved, I think, in repentance, but it's not repentance. Then among the fundamentalists, many, if you listen to them, they sure make it sound like a work. <laughs> that sinners must do to receive salvation. In other words, they got to clean up before God will accept them. they got to turn from your sins. That's how they define it. Turn from your sins. Does that not sound like works to you? You can't turn from your sins. That's why you need to be saved. Okay? You can't, you can't clean yourself up. But this is a very popular a presentation. It's from the... Uh, the Romans Road from the Little Red Book. And uh, you can go to littleredbook.org. And this is a presentation you'll find in many 
uh, where they're trying to present the gospel, they'll use this. And I'm not going to read all of this, but listen to this. Um, I tore it out and I wrote on it. And i got to find where I'm at here. <laughs> uh, okay, here it is. This is their gospel present. This is independent, fundamental Baptists that put this out, okay? Repentance. Now is the time to turn from your sin and embrace God. Now listen. The act of turning away from sin is called repentance. So they say you need to, you need to repent to be saved. And then they say it's an act of turning away from sin. Is that works or not? That sure is sad. If you were somebody who didn't know any Bible and you didn't understand the issue of repentance and you read that, you'd think, I've got to put away my sins if God's going to save me. This word implies an inward decision to follow and obey God's will instead of your self-serving sins. In other words, you've got to make a commitment that you're going to put away your sins, you're going to turn away from your sins, and you're going to follow God. And if you do that, He'll save you. That's false gospel. Grace means it's not of works. You put any works in there, it's no longer grace. Now, you want to know one of the verses they use for this? This is a so-called gospel presentation. 2 Corinthians 6, written to believers. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. You've got to separate from sin for God to save you. That's not even written to lost people. Now listen. Then they go on and say, well, it's grace, but, here, I'm quoting now, even though we're saved by faith in Christ and not by our good deeds, it is necessary to repent of our sins, and as we separate from sin, you see what they're doing? And then it says, you need to bow your head and pray. If you're going to be saved, you need to bow your head and pray. Now look, a lot of people pray when they believe the gospel, but praying has nothing to do with getting saved, okay? And when you tell people they must pray to be saved, that's a problem. A lot of religious people will do that. I'm doing something. I want to earn my salvation. I'll pray that prayer. You see the danger in it? And uh, this, is, this is what you need to do. You need to say... I, I want to accept Jesus to be worthy to enter the kingdom of heaven after I die. I, don't even, I mean, you understand what the kingdom of heaven is in regard to God putting his kingdom on the earth. It's not where you go when you die as a believer in the age of grace. Okay. I repent of my sins. I no longer want to hold on to sinful habits in my life. And the implication there is if you, you have to stop sinful habits if you're going to be saved. Okay? That's not good. <laughs> Y'all understand that, right? And I'm not reading this to nitpick and criticize. This is the type of stuff you're going to get a lot of time. And it's not clear. In fact, it's clearly wrong. Okay? It's not clear as in the truth. In fact, it muddies the water to the point it's just flat wrong. Now, what happens then, there's a lot of bad stuff out there about repentance, but what happens is people overcorrect. And they go to the other extreme in their reaction to all of the bad definitions for repentance, and they say, you don't have to repent at all to be saved. There's no repentance. And I, I've got a whole list I'm working on. I'm going to do a series of messages on all the overcorrective doctrines where people say, this is wrong, so I'm going to go to this extreme and say this, and they go the wrong way themselves. Look, the abuse of a truth shouldn't change the proper use of it. Find out what the Bible says about repentance and believe that and preach that. A lot of people abuse the word election or predestination, but they're still Bible words. Find the truth of it in the Bible and preach it. Don't stay away from it because you don't want to... Look, clarify it for people. Don't let the religious world hijack Bible words without a fight. Say, hey, no, you're wrong. That's not what it means. And then show people the truth. The answer is not to cower down and say, well, we won't even use the word then. No, use it correctly. 
So if someone asks me whether a sinner must repent in order to be saved, I must first ask them to explain what they mean by repentance. Because depending on how they define it will de determine my answer. If you, if you think repentance is turning away from sin, then I'm going to say no. Okay, You don't have to turn away from your sin to be saved. You need to know that you're a sinner and want to be saved, but you can't turn away from your sin. That's why you need to be saved. So it all, determine, it all depends on how you define the word. Now, if we believe the Bible, let the Bible interpret itself, we should have no problem with repentance. We should understand it. The problem is that so many people who are teaching and preaching the Bible don't really believe it, and they don't study it correctly. They use theological books as their authority instead of the Bible. Uh, they'll, they'll give you uh, some, you know, some, like Martin Luther's death. I don't care what Martin Luther said about repentance. What does the Bible say about repentance? Okay? And they, they'll, they'll not compare Scripture with Scripture. They'll not let the Bible define itself. They'll not rightly divide the word of truth. And therefore, there's all this confusion. Now, go please to Genesis 6. One of the most common definitions for repentance that you'll hear is it's to turn from sin. But you know what? It does not take very long in reading the Bible to find a problem with that definition. Because one of the laws of Bible study is what we call the law of first mention. And generally speaking, the first mention of a word sets the tone for how that word's used throughout the Bible. That's a general rule. The first mention of repentance is found in the sixth chapter of the Bible. And God repents. Obviously, he was not turning from sin <laughs> since he's not a sinner and has no sin. Genesis 6, verse 5, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Well, look, man, since the fall has had evil imaginations and so on, but notice every imagination's only evil continually. It reached a climax and it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. And notice this, this is very important. Because, you know, let's not act like repentance is just a mental practice. Biblical repentance is a heartfelt thing. It repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. He said, I, I am grieved at my heart about this thing, so I, I, am, I am repenting of this, and this is what I'm going to do now. The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth. Both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for repenteth me that I've made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, obviously God was not turning from sin. He has no sin. It's impossible for God to sin. Do you realize that out of the 46 references to repentance in the Old Testament, it is God that repents in 28 of those references? Repentance is mentioned 46 times in the Old Testament, and it's God that does it 28 times. Now, what does the expression, it repented the Lord, mean in this context? Simply that when he made man on the earth, he gave him dominion over it. But man fell into sin, and the wickedness of man became very great, and the Lord decided he's now going to destroy man from the face of the earth and start over with Noah and his family. It's that simple. There's a lot more to get into, but my point's not to expound in here this morning. I'm just pointing out something. Repentance is a change of mind. God said, I did this. Now, based on what man has done, I'm going to change my mind about it and do something else. And it's a heartfelt thing. It grieved him at his heart. You don't have to turn there, but I'll read a passage for it. And there's many verses. If you study, look, if you want to know what a Bible word means, read the verses. That use the word. Read it in context, meditate on it, and you'll understand the word. Zechariah chapter 8, you don't have to turn there unless you like, but Zechariah 8, verse number 13, it shall come to pass that as you were a curse among the heathen, O house of Judah and house of Israel, so will I save you, and you shall be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, as I thought, to punish you when your fathers provoked me to wrath, saith the Lord of hosts, and I repented not. So again have I thought in these days to do well unto Jerusalem, the house of Judah, fear ye not. Now the point is the repentance has to do with thoughts. 
But the Bible talks about thinking in your heart. So it's a, 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 you know, a deep-seated thing. Basically, according to the first mention of repentance, it is a change of mind that is heartfelt. Okay? Very simple. Now, you might wonder, though, doesn't the Bible say God doesn't change? <laughs> I am the Lord, I change not, Malachi 3.6. Well, yes, it says that, but the answer to this seeming contradiction is that the Lord does not change in who He is. He doesn't change in His moral principles. He doesn't change in the promises He makes. But He does change. He can, according to the Scripture, change His mind toward man on the basis of what man does. Okay? God already knew what man would do. So in reality, God repents in our perspective. God already knew it was going to happen. So it's not like He got caught off guard and said, Oh, I better change my mind. Well, he knew, but from our perspective, he said this, and now he's saying that, and there was a change. That's speaking of our perspective. So understanding that will clarify some seeming contradiction between verses that say, look, there are verses in the Bible that say God does not repent. And there are a lot of verses that say he does repent. Well, let's look at um, 1 Samuel 15. There are some matters, thank the Lord, of which God will not repent. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Romans eleven twenty nine. 29. God made some covenants with Israel and He will not repent of it. He will fulfill it all. He has set them aside in this present age of grace, but He's not finished with Israel. He'll save the nation. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. That's said in the context of God saving Israel as a nation in Romans 11. I'm glad that he's faithful in what he promises. He's promised me eternal life. He'll not repent of it. Thank God there are things he will not repent of. But the same chapter in the Bible says God repented, and then it says he will not repent, and then it says he repented. 1 Samuel 15, verse number 10. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. Why? For he, see, he's the problem, he's turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried to the Lord all night. Now look down in verse number 24. Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. But he's still blame-shifting, if you read the whole passage. He's not sincere like he needs to be. Now therefore I pray thee, pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned about to go away, he laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle and it rent. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. Talking about David. Now notice, and also... The strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. All right, now look down in verse 34. And the strength of Israel is the Lord. He's not going to repent like a man. Verse 34, then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house to Gibeah of Saul, and Samuel came no more to see uh, Saul, until the day of his death, nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented <laughs> that he made Saul king over Israel. I mean, the same chapter said he repented, but he will not repent, but he repented. You've got to look at the context of the word and how it's being used. He never repents in the sense that a man repents. Okay? And what sense is that? Numbers 23, verse 19. God is not a man that he should lie. What does that tell you? Men do lie. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, shall he not make it good? In other words, he does not repent because he did something wrong. Or he lied and he failed to keep his word. He'll never have to repent in that sense because he does not lie and he always keeps his word. He only repents in the sense that he changes his mind toward man as a result of what the man has done. 
Of course, he already knew it was going to happen, but again, that's from man's perspective. In other words, the Bible teaches he changes in his dealings with man. Okay? Now, Jonah 3. Flip back there again. That's where we were for our scripture reading. In another passage that speaks of the Lord repenting, we learn that a word closely associated with repentance is the word turn. If you noted that in Jonah 3, at the latter part of the chapter, we won't read all the chapter again because we just did it for our scripture reading before the message, but jump in at verse 8. Notice the association with turning and repenting. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. And who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. Well, they did that because they believed the message. And this was the result of that faith. And God repented of the evil that he said that he would do unto them. He did it not. Now, the gospel of the grace of God wasn't preached to the Ninevites. Okay. This is not a passage on salvation in the age of grace. But the point is that God said through the prophet Jonah he would overthrow the wicked city of Nineveh in 40 days. But because they turned from their evil way, God turned from the evil. Not evil in the, in the sense of sin because God does not sin, but evil in the sense of judgment. The word evil is not always referencing uh, immoral things. Evil is the opposite of good. Man looks at God's judgment as an evil thing, but it's a, it's a right thing. But it's not pleasant is the point. So he's going to turn away from judging them. My point in that passage is this. Genuine repentance, as we've already established, is a change of mind, a heartfelt change of mind, that should result in a change of direction. Right? I mean, if, if you really from your heart are agreeing with God now and what God's Word says, doesn't it make sense that there should follow some things that would evidence that? I, I'm not saying that. Look, that's not the, that's, that's the result of repentance, but it's not repentance. In other words, the act of turning is not repentance. Repentance precedes that. In other words, if you now agree with God, then if you really believe what He said, then there ought to be some demonstration in, in the direction you're now going that aligns up with what God said. God told them to stop doing those things. And they, they believed that and they agreed with that, so they did. Now, again, that's not a passage on salvation in the age of grace. But, it's, it, but the point of reading it is to show that the word turn is associated with repent. But it's not the word. You understand that? So repentance is a heartfelt change of mind. Well, if that's occurred, there ought to be some kind of Evidence of that, it would seem, and don't, don't get nervous now, but Paul did say that himself, and I'll show you in just a little bit. Just hang tight. Look, I don't care what people say about this. All I care is what God said about it. Let the Bible be true. It is. I don't, in case you haven't noticed, I don't do the party line on things. There, in every group, it's like, if, if you're really one of us, you'll say it just like this. I'll say it like the Bible says it. I'm not going to check with some other teacher to see how he says it. If what he says doesn't line up with what this says, this is right and he's wrong. So just follow me. Don't judge the message till it's over, okay? It'll be over in the next hour. Then you can pass your conclusion on the thing, all right? Look in 2 Corinthians 7. We'll go to the New Testament a little bit here. Another common definition for repentance is sorrow for sin. They said, if you, if, you, if you have repentance, you're sorrowing. And some even, especially down in the South, they teach you got to go through a season of guilt and sorrow and, and before God will save you. You know, you got to labor under the pains of Holy Ghost conviction for months or even years before you can finally get saved. As soon as you know you're a lost sinner and you want to be saved, you can believe the gospel and be saved. And if you have sense, you'll do that pretty quick. <laughs> okay? Now look, you ought to be sorry that you've sinned against God. But the sorrow for sin is not the repentance. They go to 2 Corinthians 7, verse 9 and 10. Now rejoice that not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us in nothing. 
He said, you sorrowed to repentance. Well, he's writing to believers here. For godly sorrow worketh repentance. To salvation not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. The context is not salvation of lost sinners, but repentance in the life of believers. The salvation he mentions in verse 10 is salvation from the power of sin in the daily life of a believer. If godly sorrow worketh repentance, then sorrow for sin should precede and produce repentance, but it's not repentance. Now, godly sorrow is sorrow not just for what you did and for the consequences, but for what you are. Okay? Paul said, Oh, wretched man that I am! Right? You sin because you're a sinner. And you need to realize you've sinned against a holy and righteous God. And so, yes, there ought to be this realization that I am a lost sinner and I have sinned against God and I deserve His judgment. Now that's from the power of the Holy Spirit. That's not of the flesh. The sorrow of the world is sorrow because of the consequences of sin. It's self-centered. I'm sorry that I got caught. I'm sorry that this is making life inconvenient for me. Lost people in the world may have sorrow for sin and not repent. The difference is godly sorrow and the sorrow of the world. Now, some preachers try to gauge the reality of someone's repentance on the visibility of their sorrow. In other words, unless you were shedding many tears and pleading at an altar, then you didn't get saved. But godly sorrow that works repentance takes place in the heart. And by the way, again, this is not even talking to lost sinners. This is written to believers. But godly sorrow may or may not show up visibly and, uh, based upon the personality of a person. And, you know, not everybody has, the same, look, not everybody has the same emotional constitution. Some people cry about everything. Some people, it takes quite a bit to get them to cry. Miss Payton and I were talking just uh, the other day when I was visiting her on her birthday. Happy birthday again, Miss Payton. But she made mention of the fact, you know, I just don't cry hardly. I said, I don't feel bad, neither do I. <laughs> but I do, but, but that, that, that's not the issue. The issue is not how much you cried when you got saved. Don't put the emphasis on the experience. People have different experiences because they're different people. But salvation is the same. Believe the gospel. But the experience that surrounds it may not be the same for everybody. And it's not. Aren't you glad Paul didn't say, if you want to be saved, make sure you head out to Damascus and wait for a light to shine and strike you down. And then when you go through what I went through, then you'll know you're saved. Well, he's the only one who went through that. The preachers who got saved at what they call an old-fashioned altar, when they preach, usually make it to, to where everybody has to do it that way. If you didn't get saved down at the altar like I did, well, look, that's not even in the Bible. <laughs> okay, so that's not the issue. Now, sorrow for sin, by the way, does not automatically mean a person has repented in sincerity. Because there was a man named Esau who sold his birthright. And it says in Hebrews 12, verse 16, Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. He sought the, the blessing, not the repentance. That's not what, he's not, it's not saying he sought the repentance and couldn't get it. He was seeking to undo what he did. He was seeking that blessing, but he couldn't change it. And he sought it carefully with tears, and yet he didn't repent in that he turned to God. He was just sorry that he made a mistake. How many doubt their salvation because they wonder if they've repented enough? Well, I, wasn't a, I, I didn't cry as much as they did. Maybe I didn't really repent. Repentance is not measured in degrees. You either changed your mind and believed the gospel or you didn't. There's no such thing as repenting enough. That's penance. That's not repentance. 
Some teach repentance equals salvation. However, there's an example in the Bible of a man that repented and went to hell. Did you know that? His name was Judas. The Bible says in Matthew 27, he had a guilty conscience about betraying the Lord for those 30 pieces of silver, and it says he repented. But he did not repent with godly sorrow, turning to the Lord. He just repented that. He said, you know, I changed my mind. He tried to bring the money back. But he wasn't trusting the Lord. He was a devil. Okay, now, based on what we've seen so far, it should be obvious that the basic meaning of repentance is a heartfelt change of mind. So we can't take all the references to repentance in the Bible and apply it to the issue of individual salvation in the age of grace because the fact of the matter is God has repented. Christians should repent. Judas repented and went to hell. There's all kind of variations. You've got to look at the context. You've got to look at the context of the word. Now, I'm not, from this point forward, to, to save time, I'm not going to look at all the other references. I'm going to quote some things, but we will look at a few things Paul said as we finish up. Some teach that in order for sinners to be saved, they must first do certain works to prove their repentance. And they get that out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And John the Baptist and Christ in his earthly ministry and the apostles there in the earthly ministry to Israel said, bring forth fruit. If you've repented, then there must be this fruit or you'll be hewn down and cast into the fire. That's the gospel of the kingdom. The context of that preaching was God's dealings with Israel who were in a covenant relationship with Him. And the law of covenant basically said, obey and be blessed or disobey and be cursed. And Christ conducted His whole earthly ministry under the law according to the scriptures. So the gospel, even though he was preparing the way for the new covenant, he was still preaching under the Old Testament dispensation. That's the gospel of the kingdom. That's not the gospel of the grace of God that Christ later revealed through Paul. You're making a mistake if you go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as the basis of preaching the gospel of the grace of God. I'm not saying you can't carefully make some application sometime, but it's a different gospel being preached there. People love Luke 13, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And they make that the main theme. Uh, turn or burn, you know, and they preach repentance. They preach repentance. And guess what? Under the gospel of the kingdom, repentance was the message. It was emphasized. The message was repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Now there are those who come along say, you got you to gotta, uh, be you got to get into the uh, baptism of repentance to receive salvation. They go to Acts 2.38. Peter said to Israel, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Well, he's talking to Israel. And it's not that water baptism saved them in and of itself. It's just that they were required under that message to demonstrate their faith and repentance by participating in that ceremonial purification and preparation of the kingdom. It's got nothing to do with us. And I, don't, I know I don't have to prove that to this crowd this morning. I'm sure you're aware of this. But water baptism has nothing to do with salvation in the age of grace. Paul said, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And like I've said many times, you could not preach the gospel of the kingdom without water baptism, but you can't preach the gospel of the grace of God with it. When you bring in water baptism and say, if you really believe you'll be baptized, you're no longer preaching the gospel of the grace of God. The gospel of the grace of God is that Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again. Now we need to turn to him in faith, trusting in his work, and we're saved by his grace. It's that simple. And when you believe the gospel, <clears throat> the Bible said, by one spirit are we all baptized in the one body. And that's the baptism that matters. Water baptism can do nothing for you. It's not even in the message that's to be preached in the age of grace in terms of the gospel. But what do people do? They, and look, we know it says in Mark 16, he that believes is baptized shall be saved. We know, it, we know it says that, but that's the gospel of the kingdom. How do I know? Just a few days before that, he said, This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. For a witness to all nations, then the end shall come. Then he told those same guys, Go into all the world, preach the gospel. 
Well, that's the gospel of the kingdom. That required water baptism was followed by signs. The gospel of the grace of God does not require water baptism and is not followed by signs. It's different. You've got to rightly divide the word of truth. All right, let's finish. Try to come to a point here. Now, the question again, we kind of already answered it at the beginning, but let me reinforce it a little bit. Should sinners repent in this age of grace? Do sinners need to repent? Well, the gospel we preach today was revealed through Paul. He received it by revelation of Jesus Christ. So we need to look at what Paul said. Go to Acts 17. We'll look at a couple of these. It takes time when you try to build, lay a foundation and build a message on Bible. Okay? And I'm, I'm proving to you from the Scripture what repentance is. It's not, it doesn't matter what I think it is or what you think it is. What saith the Scripture? Paul's preaching to a bunch of heathen in Athens. And we know about the heathen in Athens. I remind you, I know the bulldogs are good this year. I know that. The Bible said without our dogs. They're not going to be in the, in, in the New Jerusalem. <laughs> Athens was wholly given to idolatry. You ever see the way those fans act? It's idolatry. It's ungodly. <laughs> All right, that's enough. Okay, Acts 17. Boy, Jared Brandon came in this morning with a glow about his face because they stomped South Carolina and we got beat by Kentucky at home for the first time since 1979. That's preaching right there. I'm burdened about that thing. I'm telling it's a sign of the times. We're in the last days. The last time Kentucky beat Florida, I was six years old, man. In 1986, that's the last time they beat us. They hadn't beat us at home since night. Oh, God, help us. All right, that's enough. All right. I'm not watching it the rest of the year because it's just a game. It's but a big waste of time. Last night after the game, I repented in dust and ashes. All right. <laughs> and Brother Ben don't have much to talk about either about Georgia Tech, does he? <laughs> All right, enough of that foolishness. Acts 17, verse 30. He's preaching to the men of Athens here. And he says, let's just jump in for a sake of time. We're already past time. And the times of this ignorance God winked at. In other words, he didn't bring the swift judgment that he could have on their idolatry. But now, in this age of grace, we like those but nows, don't we? Right? We know what but now means when Paul says it. But Paul says, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance to all men, and that he raised him from the dead. Okay, he's preaching to these people, and he tells them that God wants all men everywhere to repent. Quit trusting in your idols. Trust in God. Look in Acts 20, verse 21. Paul talked about his ministry that he received of the Lord and how he went about it. And he said in verse 21, what was he doing? Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Gentiles. What? Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is God. So they go together. In other words, it's not just repentance because Judas repented. But it has to be the right kind of repentance, but it has to be accompanied with faith, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. One more, look in Acts 26. He's giving his testimony before Agrippa, and he talks about how the Lord saved him and commissioned him. Notice what he says in verse 16. This is what the Lord said to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus when he got saved. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. Now Christ revealed the gospel to Paul, and he continued to reveal more revelations through Paul concerning this age. This is what he says, Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee. And when he sends them forth, what is his ministry going to be about? To open their eyes. How is he going to do that? By what he preaches. And to turn them, notice that, from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. It's all about faith, but there's a turning here to God. Notice, 
Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. All right. Are we talking about Paul's commission? Are we talking about Paul's ministry? Okay. The Lord sent him forth. And I know there's a, some distinction between his acts, ministry, and afterward. But Paul didn't preach two different gospels. He didn't preach one gospel in Acts and one afterward, unless you're a hyper-dispensationalist in the true sense of the word. No, he was preaching the gospel, the grace of God in the book of Acts. He talks about it in Acts 20. He said he received of the Lord to testify the gospel, the grace of God. All right, so as he's preaching this, what does he say? Verse 20, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. That's what Paul said. That's what the Lord gave him to do. Now, let's, let's be careful. You, it's easy sometimes to, to take something and, and misunderstand it. Notice, first of all, repent and turn to God. That's two different things. The turning is the faith. You've changed your mind, heartfelt, you were trusting in idols. You were trusting in your own supposed righteousness. Now you're changing your mind. You're agreeing with God. And now you're turning to Him by faith for salvation. Well, if you've done that, then there ought to be some works meet for repentance. And meet means fitting and suitable. He's saying not for salvation, but because of salvation. There's a difference. Under the gospel of the kingdom, it said if you don't bring forth fruit, you'll be hewn down and cast in the fire. That's not what he said. What he says here lines up with Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Works have a place. We just need to put them in the right place. In this age of grace, they are the expression. They are the result. They are the fruit. They have nothing to do with receiving the salvation. Now. So a sinner must repent in that he changes his mind about sin and decides, you know what, I want to be saved from my sin. Man, when I, there was a time I, I lived it up in this world and I enjoyed it. But then the Lord dealt with my heart and I'm like, you know what, I need to be saved. I'm a mess. I'm a wretch. I'm lost. I'm, I'm ungodly. I'm wicked. I'm unrighteous. I've changed my mind. I don't want to be in this mess anymore. So I agree with God. I want to be saved from my... Let me tell you something. Don't bypass this. We started in Romans 2. Look, the whole first part of Romans is to bring people under condemnation to prepare them to receive justification. If you don't realize you're a lost sinner, condemned already, you'll not trust Christ. What do you need a Savior for? Believing the gospel is not accepting a historical fact that everybody down south anyway seems to know. And even the devil knows Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. But unless in your heart you know that you're a sinner and he died for your sins and you want him to save you and it's a real personal thing from the heart, hey, that's real, man. You got to know you're a sinner and you can't save yourself. You can't put away your sins. That's why you need to be saved. And so you repent about sin in the sense that, you know what, I want to be saved from this. And then, you know what, whatever it was you were trusting, whether it was idols or trying to earn your salvation by your works, you're going to turn from whatever it was you were trusting and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. The whole issue in salvation is what are you trusting? The church at Thessalonica was a model church, and he talked about their testimony. In 1 Thessalonians 1.9, he said, You turn to God from idols. You quit trusting your idols, and you trusted in the Lord. What are you trusting? Are you trusting your baptism, your church membership, your good works, your praying through, your this, your that? Maybe you're trusting your repentance. Repentance doesn't save you. Only Christ saves you. But you do need to change your mind and agree with Him. Look, okay, it's this simple. It's this simple. I, at one time, was an, a lost sinner, didn't even know the gospel. When I heard the gospel, there came a point where in my heart, 
I agreed with God, said that is the truth, I believe it, and I changed my mind in that whereas I didn't believe it, now I do. That's repentance. Everybody who gets saved repents, whether they are conscious of it or not. So, repentance is not a work. In fact, in, in Acts 11, it talks about how God granted repentance to the Gentiles. If it wasn't for the Lord working in your heart through the gospel, you wouldn't change your mind. <laughs> okay? Now, he, you still got to choose to trust Christ, but He works on your heart first through the gospel. Now, therefore, we should not be emphasizing repentance when we, when we share the gospel. Because the message is not repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. That's not the message. The message is you're a lost sinner. Christ died for your sins. If you want to be saved, you realize you need to be saved, then in your heart trust the Lord and He'll save you. And when you do that, that is repentance. So it's the goodness of God that leadeth thee to repentance. Whenever the Lord went forth to Israel commanding them to repent, most of them didn't. You can't demand people repent. In other words, that's not going to make them repent. More than that is going to be the goodness of God. And when you share the gospel, the grace of God, hey, you think Saul of Tarsus, and I'm closing up, I'm closing shop here. You think Saul of Tarsus was in a repentant mood on the way to Damascus when he was going after disciples to kill him, put him in prison? But the Lord struck him down by exceeding abundant grace. It was the grace of God, the love of God, the mercy of God that caused Saul of Tarsus to repent. He didn't repent under the preaching of what was going on in Israel through John the Baptist and the earthly ministry of Christ, but he repented under the gospel of the grace of God. So all we need to do is share the gospel that Christ died for our sins and that He is the only way. He is the Savior and that we must trust in His finished work, His death, burial, and resurrection. But if, if, if you know, what is it? It's Christ died for what? Our sin. You've got to deal with the sin issue. And a sinner needs to know they're a sinner. Else why would they trust a Savior? But don't emphasize repentance because... A lot of people are confused about it. If you preach the gospel and a sinner believes it, he has repented. That's the right way to go about it. Don't get rid of it just because people mess it up. And these are the verses in Acts and also Romans 2 that makes it clear in the age of grace, sinners do need to repent. But it's not the repentance that saves. And you better make sure you understand what the word means. Okay? Let's stand together if you would.